we are back for flip video 4.3. We are going to be taking a look at the two systems that really defined both the political and the social and really economic systems of Europe during the medieval period, known as feudalism and manneralism. So let's get started with the essential question at the top. How did feudalism and manneralism define medieval Europe? So we discussed this already, and it might sound quite familiar because the circumstances are similar to the feudal system of Japan. When Charlemagne died, his efforts of reunifying Western Europe uh, essentially died with him, and the central government was once again weak. There was no unifying force here. And more importantly, that the, the central government could not protect the people from foreign invaders. You'll recall those maps where we saw all the different invading uh, groups, the Vikings, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, all of those different groups reemerge, and we have lots of instability. So farmers begin surrendering their land and or, and or losing their land to leadership um, in, in an effort to exchange that land in return for protection. So the new system order that emerges here is a system that's based upon what are called fiefs. Fiefs is when land is given in exchange for military service and loyalty. So there's a direct exchange. The higher nobles, the higher people, the people of uh, greater power, will give a plot of land or an area of land in return for that person to whom they are giving the land, so that person must pledge loyalty and allegiance and provide military service when needed. So in this way, we have, it's not, there's no sort of monetary, there is currency at the time, there is, there is money. But when you don't have a strong unifying government and unifying force, what really deserts power is not the acquisition of money, but really the acquisition of land and owning land. So land becomes the currency of Western, uh, Western Euro European society and reorders the uh, society as such. So, still on the central question, or still on the question on the left of why did feudalism emerge, on the right, the people who were given those fiefs, they assumed a new title, and that title was a vassal. They became a vassal to their higher lord. A vassal, therefore, is a person who receives land and pledges loyalty and military service in return, which you can see from the graphic at the right. The king provides the, a lord with a fief and peasants to work that, that fief, and in return, the Lord will provide loyalty and military aid. So that's a very simplistic form, um, representation of this vassal relationship. Therefore, oh, actually, let me back it up for a second. The Lord, however, when we're talking about a fief, we're talking about something the size of Washington, D.C. We're talking about a massive territory of land. The Lord would then divide up that fief into smaller plots, smaller little villages. And those little villages would be run by a lesser noble or a knight. Similarly, the Lord provides that land, provides the, um, the living quarters there, and in return, the knight provides the military service and his loyalty. So this whole system that we have emerging, whereby land is given in return for military service, that's what we call feudalism, this new system that we saw the exact same concept emerge in Japan with a few differences, uh, but the same idea of land in exchange for military loyalty. What this leads to is the creation of these essentially mini towns. Because the fief is sort of, again, think of the fief as Washington, D.C., and the manor is the life that's built on top of it. You notice the question, the central, or the term on the left changed here, the main idea. How is the feudal society organized? Or the whole society is organized into manners, and these manners were large, self sufficient. Self sufficient means they do not depend on anybody else. These are self-sufficient land holdings, so it's either its own independent territory that consisted of a lord's residence, which would be called the manor house, the large house, typically even in the form of a castle with the walled areas so that all of the townspeople could come into the castle for protection if need be. Um, there was the peasant village, the fields, the surrounding lands, the church. I mean, this is massive. So the manor is this entire widespread territory. Manneralism now is the idea, is the economic system. The ism -ism in, implies that there's some sort of system or process here. So feudalism is the system of exchanging land in return for military service. Manneralism is the economic system that complements this, that, that goes right alongside this. The economic system is built upon the manor. So we have this, the social system is feudalism, economic system is manneralism. Manneralism is that the entire, that we have a lord who's in charge of these lesser nobles or lesser lords. Um, who are ultimately going to end with, with serfs, and everyone is responsible for, have these mutual roles and responsibilities in ensuring that the manor stays uh, functioning and then provides for everyone. So manneralism is the economic piece of feudalism. So how is this organized? Who's involved in what role? We do have kings here, kings or monarchs, but the kings were primarily figureheads at this point. People remain loyal, 
because they were seen as religious figures they were, and religious significance, much as we saw with Charlemagne and the relationship with the Pope. But the real day-to-day -day existence of feudalism really was on this level, and I'm just going to point to it, of lords and, and knights and serfs. This is really the territory that most people experience in day-to-day -day life in, in medieval Europe. The lords were these powerful landowners. They were the ones who were in charge of the manor, and they were, of course, vassals of the king. They were, if should the king call upon them for military service, they in turn would ensure that the knights and sometimes even the peasants would be called up in order to defend the king. But these are powerful. I mean, it's just how powerful was a lord? And why don't you think of Lord Farquhar from Shrek? So the idea, I mean, when you've got Shrek and Donkey, they're not looking for the king. They're looking for Lord Farquhar. Look up for Lord Farquhar's castle. Look at his whole manor that he has here. That's, that's an excellent representation of the idea that uh, there may have been a king involved here, but for all intents and purposes, Lord Farquhar is the one in charge. So, ridiculous, but helpful to consider sort of the day-to-day -day living of mannerism and feudalism. Below those lords would be the lesser knights. The knights, of course, are vassals to the lord, since they receive lands from the, the lords. They're members of the military elite. They received land in return for that military service and loyalty. Very interestingly, they, they too, just like those samurais in the Code of the Bushido, Bushido these knights lived by a strong moral code of conduct known as chivalry. And chivalry was this emphasized courage and honor and justice and this readiness to help the weak. So this concept of, of chivalry and being chivalrous really dates back to these knights who lived by this code of honor. That is exactly the same concept as what happened with the samurais in Japan. So really an interesting parallel um, in history that these two feudal systems emerged at similar times. Of course, none of this is fair. And the vast majority of the population were the serfs. Sixty percent of the population, they worked um, on. They worked and farmed the land in the manner exchange for uh, for shelter, protection, and food. But the food, of course, is what they produce. They're making that food. Uh, the peasant. There's technically a difference between a peasant and a serf because technically a, a peasant had the ability to leave, and could leave the the uh, manor. Well, serfs could not, but in, in practice and in, in actuality, there really wasn't much of a difference here between a peasant and a serf. And, many, and, if for, and many people would argue that the serf is essentially uh, slavery. Now, I don't like to compare and contrast to say better or worse. Enslavement is enslavement, um, but this is this type of this isn't a type of indentured servitude. I guess is the best way you could describe this. So serfs make up the bottom, um, and this then in this system, the the serfs uh, there is no no social mobility. There's no ability for one person to move from one social class to the next. You're born into the social class that you're in and that's what you will remain in. Knights of course have training and there's a little bit difference there but the idea here is that this social class system is rigid. There is no um, there's no moving from us becoming a serf and working hard to become a knight to working hard to become a lord so on and so forth. In this system only the lords and the nobles became wealthy. The lord was in charge of the manor and of course I already mentioned this is loyal to the king but on a day-to-day -day level, this is still a, a very elite aristocratic class at the top with, heart, with the vast majority of the society at the bottom. So there we go. Four analysis questions. Um, the last one for comp comparing systems of Japan and Europe. A lot of us, simply when I ask you to compare, are just simply writing definition of one, definition of another. That's not a comparison. A comparison I need to see, while X did this, why did this? In other words, I need to see a direct relationship drawn between Japanese feudalism and uh, European feudalism and the way that they are similar and the way that they are different. All right, guys, that's it. See you in class.